That was my first exposure to these old recipes. And then suddenly, you know, things just make sense. It's like, wow, well, okay, that's why, you know, this is a recipe from 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's why we drink beer now. This is Beer Geek Bucket List. You also did some, some work with some, with some old recipes, beer as well. Mm. Some of the history of, of London brewing, I guess. Should we pull out some of those? Do you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's Hold do on. it. Hold on. And I think the most important thing about the old recipes for us is that they're old London recipes. Yep. And they're, you know, one of the travesties of brewing is that you know, there was a great history of brewing throughout these islands that kind of, in many cases, just got lost by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And in London especially, you know, it was just, except for Fuller's obviously now, there was a whole history and tradition of brewing that was just completely eviscerated. And whole styles of beer like Porter and Stout, Porter and Stout being quintessentially London things yep. that were developed and they evolved in London. And in the mid 70s, I think they were, I mean, they were almost extinct through the whole country. Apparently there's a point in the 70s where there was no porter being made here on the British Isles. Something like Anchor Porter was, you know, somebody going around, knocking around old archives and making a beer. Yeah. Uh, and so so um, how, how did you get into, I guess, the, the concept of, of this beer? You know, you said a, a third of your body weight was, was Guinness <laughs> at one point. Um, exactly. Now it's a, a third export stout. Um, my exposure to these came through a homebrew club that I uh, was one of the founding members of, the London Amateur Brewers. Again, you know, the state of brewing in this country being so appalling that there wasn't even a homebrew club in London. Okay. I mean, you know, what, 10 million people and nobody wants to brew at home? There wasn't a homebrew shop. There was one kind of way out past Wimbledon, so you had to go to the end of the Northern Line going south and then take another bus for half an hour. I remember going out there twice. The second time I went out there, the guy who was owned it was feeling ill, so he didn't open that day. And after going from two and a half hours from my house, yep. it was just like, I can't do this anymore. But there was one homebrew club. They produced these pamphlets, one of them, which they still produce now, which is called Old British Beers and How to Make Them. And they scale everything down to one gallon homebrew size yep. and various different amounts of pale malt, brown malt, black malt, pale malt, brown malt, for the dark ones. And the pale ones were just pale malt and fuckloads of fuckles in everything. Um, so you know it's good. Exactly. And. There was two guys who were in this Durden Park beer circle who came to our London Amateur Brewers homebrew club. Uh, one guy called Mike, who was one of the loveliest men that I know, and he brought in a recipe that he'd taken from the Durden Park beer circle. It was a Flowers Christmas Stout, 1870 recipe. Mm -hmm. We were kind of like, yeah, yeah, what's this old stuff? And it was just mind blowing. And he said he also, the other thing that I learned a lot from him was that he basically did everything wrong as well. Like the original recipe had a load of sugar, and he said, I don't like putting sugar in my beer. The original recipe said age for a year, so it mellows out nicely. It was two weeks old. Uh, and he put Cascade in, because he likes Cascade. Yep. That, they would have used American hops in those days too, along with Fuggles, just whatever they could get their hands on. Now, whether the American hops tasted like Cascade, we don't know. Whether Fuggles once tasted like Cascade, probably unlikely, but I think after we can dream. Pro probably the amount of time and, and uh, uncaring storage that the hops had, they probably all tasted much the same. Precisely, precisely. And especially if they're using ones from like three harvests ago. Yeah. Um, but that was my first exposure to these old recipes. And then suddenly, you know, things just make sense. It's like, wow, well, okay, that's why, you know, this is a recipe from 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's why we drink beer now. Because beer that then was really good. Yep. And okay, we lost sight of it a bit along the way. But, you know, these things are still out there. And, and how um, did the guy get the recipe? One of their members uh, spent a lot of time going into archives and okay. deciphering things. Most brewers kind of kept records, like I'm sure you do, but in the old days with handwriting and, and secrets and stuff, they would just make things very impossible for anybody else to understand, I think on purpose. Yeah. Otherwise, just things like weights and measures that we don't use anymore, you know, like bushels. Mm -hmm. Throw in a couple of bushels of, of what? And you know, and sometimes the malt might be just named after the field it came from or the place. And if you don't know what that field is or that place is, it's just a confusing word in the middle of a sentence that you just don't understand. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I've had a look at a couple, but I can't make head or tails of any of it. Um, I mean, in those days, all the second, uh, most of the fermentation would happen in wood and aging would have happened in wood and beers like this would have been aged for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So the export stout that we make regularly, well, we mature it in stainless and actually it turns over relatively fast. We don't vat it, we don't let it go old, we don't let it go stale. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's a fresh, I mean, in terms of not being in sour or not being full of bread. Yep. Uh, this one we put in barrels. So this, actually half of this batch is those old cognac barrels we were talking about. So they had some spirit in them. Mm -hmm. So they were and the other fresh half cognac. When red wine when barrels. But uh, they were like old red wine barrels that we'd, oh no, there was, sorry, there were two 
There's two fresh red wine barrels which had a really heavy toast, which is not something we look for in our barrels. Yeah. So we just put a dark beer in there because that, you know, the toast might kind of play with that. But we just we picked a slightly different recipe. Basically, they kind of tend to vary the proportions of brown and black malt. So hot um, wise for this one? Usually, in these sort of beers, we put in something like Magnum. Okay. Because we can't physically get enough fuggles in. Mm -hmm. It's just, we can't. And it's right, right at the start of the Just for the start of the, the, of the board, just for bitterness, yeah. So yeah. we'll use the high alpha hop, that's a nice clean bitterness, yeah. something like Magnum usually. We have done it with Fuggles or Bramling Cross before. Um, it's just radically inefficient because we just can't physically get enough in. Um, so this is 9.3, um, which, you know, wasn't an unusual strength back in the day. Cheers. Cheers. There's a couple of really fascinating things that I think about this. Uh, one is it tastes almost slightly tart, but I don't think we've had it sent off for analysis like mm -hmm. we do with all beers. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no wild yeast or, or lactopedia in there. Um, but there is something that makes it quite tart. I don't know, is it the wine barrel or something like that? Um, and the other thing is that we really like about this is that you know, there's quite a contemporary love affair with pastry stouts, you know, big, sweet, you know, marshmallow, vanilla, chocolate, you know, all those lovely dessert things, donuts, I don't know, whatever, mm -hmm. s'mores. Whereas these old recipes are dry, especially the wood aging dries it out even more. Yeah. So it's kind of, you're giving somebody just a different version of what a barrel aged big imperial stout might be. Um, and that's kind of, that's the bit that, uh, that I like, that, that kind of, that slight catch or rasp at the end that makes you kind of, like, I, we had somebody come up to us and tell, tell us this was refreshing. Mm. And it's like, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, it's 9.3% <laughs> big stout, but yeah, we want it to be refreshing rather than yeah. heavy, toy, sweet. You really yeah. get that. You, know, you talk about the, 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 the tartness or the slight sourness. That you, it has a, quite a strange mouthfeel in that the, the, the first bit is maybe a little sharp, but then yeah. it goes fat in your palate in the yeah. middle, and then it just kind of dries out yeah. uh, towards the end. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is the which black mold and the wood kind of working together. Because often with these beers as well, you get this really lovely interplay between the bitterness from the hops and the bitterness from the dark malt. And they start, one starts turning into the other. And, and this one also has a bit, it feels like the wood is adding a bit of bitterness as well with the tannin or the astringency. 